Attorney Olivia Taylor was one of the first people to meet Douglas Chappell. She was introduced by the head of Schenectady Administrative Offices at the first sight of the tall, very handsome executive. Olivia had a personal attraction that took all her professional poise to suppress. She would have to work with him after all. And she was not the kind of woman who gushed over a man or openly flirted. Douglas Chappell was the new chief of the Real Estate Tax Division of Schenectady. Olivia was a senior associate attorney in the corporate counsel's office. The Real Property Group was a separate but associated office at Schenectady. Doug wasn't Olivia's boss, and he wasn't exactly above her in the corporate strata. However, he was a rising star and one clearly destined for great advancement. He was also amazingly handsome and possessed that unique set of personal attributes defined as charisma. His arrival sent a shockwave through the female staff of Schenectady from the women in the production plants to those in the executive suites. The legal division was mostly female, staffed at both the clerical and professional levels. It was particularly affected. At first, Olivia paid little attention to the whispering and speculations among her female co-workers. She was not unaffected, but she chose not to engage in such behavior. As the rumors of Doug's intimate prowess and his notable attributes grew, her interest peaked. Despite her determination, she observed her colleagues and even her own secretary, Julie Stevenson, engaging in overt flirtation with Doug Chappell. But Olivia refrained from such behavior. As an attorney and a married woman, she had progressed in her career to the point of owning an attractive side hall colonial house in Delmar, close to the elementary school. This was a step towards starting a family, a topic she and her husband David were considering in her typical fashion. Olivia had put a good bit aside for the eventuality of children. She was a planner and meticulous in preparation for each of the defined stages of her life. To some, her marriage to David at the end of college and before law school might have seemed precipitous, but in fact, it was part of a carefully considered strategy. David began teaching middle school science while she went to law school. David put off his career ambition of becoming a marine biologist. He had envisioned himself living on a boat in a more southern climate. That was the kind of romantic dream David was prone to, and a substantial part of what endeared him to his more practical wife as their married life unfolded. David found joy in teaching, and over the last two years, resumed his graduate studies during evenings and summers with their combined incomes. The couple felt ready to embrace parenthood, yet David's dream remained just that, a dream stranded on the banks of the upper Hudson River. Their dog, Buster, was the only unexpected element in Olivia's orderly life. Buster was a rescue. Olivia's husband, David, took his class to the animal shelter on a field trip at the shelter. David found a forlorn pup that appeared too unconventional in appearance to be adopted quickly. However, David, being a romantic, was charmed by the dog's large brown eyes. He looked past the Irish wolfhound and St. Bernard Mix's awkward appearance and brought the newly named Buster home to Olivia. She initially had reservations about this new member of their small household, but it seemed a minor trade-off for the loss of a significant dream. The puppy grew into a monstrously large, ugly dog that scared visitors, but only for a moment. Buster was an affectionate giant whose only threat was that he might lick you to death. Olivia found herself loving the great beast almost as much as she loved her husband. They were two big, lovable creatures who looked odd and fierce, but were loving and beautiful within. Olivia had a house, a dog, and a happy, contented marriage with the promise of children to come. Or at least she did until Doug Chappell began his move on her. She was exactly his type. A pretty girl maturing into a more beautiful woman. She hadn't yet lost the shyness and trepidation of her youth, and still had that visage of innocence so appealing in a young bride. But most of all, she was holding herself away from him, to a man who enjoyed easy success with women. The ones he had to work for were always more desirable. Entering Olivia's office one afternoon, Doug said, We need to do something about these triple net leases in the town of Colony. He moved around Olivia's desk until he was standing all but touching her. He had one arm over the back of her desk chair and the other pointing to the spreadsheet he had laid out on her desktop. 
GE Real Property Division had a substantial history of success fighting real property taxes. However, the town of Colony was a formidable opponent. The town had significant commercial expansion dating back to the 1960s and had developed a vigorous defense of its assessments. What do you propose? Olivia queried Doug. She had turned in her chair as she said this, and it put her virtually between his arms. She was close enough to feel the heat of his body, and she felt his almost magnetic pull. I thought that since we have the rights of the owners assigned to us under the leases, we could file an interim proceeding on the property assessments. All of them. He looked her straight in the eyes as he responded. Yes, all of them. I never like leaving anything unfinished. She could feel that he was talking about more than the leases, and it set off an excitement within her that was exhilarating and frightening. At the same time, that's a big undertaking. You will find there is a strong defense. I find that a robust defense can always overcome the defense. Olivia began working on the tax cases with Doug. He hired independent appraisers and initiated the tax protests, while Olivia started preparing the interim petitions. Ingram is Latin for in the thing, which in these cases refers to the real property. There is no action against a defendant, only a request for the court to review the assessment. The town stood by its assessments, which were nearly all the standard 150% of value instead of the actual value the law required. Still, Olivia was required to do a lot of work preparing these cases for trial. Doug kept the work under his personal supervision, and that required him to have a lot of contact with Olivia. He was serious about presenting a strong case in both the tax issues and against Olivia's rejection of his romantic pursuits. She resisted fiercely, despite her inner conflict about yielding to his initial overtures. She was an ordinary woman with all the typical desires, but her lack of experience compounded her dilemma. Olivia had known no one intimately except her husband. He was her first as she was his in her plans. They would remain faithful to each other until death parted them. But she couldn't help wondering what being with another man would be like. She had no doubt that Doug was exceptional in bed. There were several women in her office who had reportedly been involved with him, including Olivia's secretary, Julie, who had a two-month relationship with Doug. Julie boasted about her time with Doug and ended their affair only when her husband grew suspicious. Julie's husband was not understanding or forgiving. Olivia was different from Julie, and even though Olivia's husband, David, wasn't prone to jealousy, his trust and unconditional love made it harder for Olivia to deceive him. She was not unfaithful. Olivia wouldn't act disloyal. But Doug was difficult to ignore. And deep down, she knew she didn't want to. It was not like David was a slouch in the bedroom. But he was ordinary, above average height, below average looks and averagely endowed where it counted. If you judged men by their character, David was a prince. He was certainly Olivia's prince, and she had known that from their first meeting, sitting next to each other in freshman biology. They just clicked on so many levels. She did love David, but there was something about Doug that made him irresistible. True to his word, Doug launched a determined pursuit. He flirted without restraint. He complimented her hair, shoes, her dress, and any small piece of jewelry or embellishment she wore if she were honest with herself. Olivia would have recognized that almost from Doug's first appearance at the offices, she had been dressing differently. She stopped wearing pants to work. Her pinstriped lawyer's suit jackets were paired with matching skirts that became tighter and shorter as the seasons changed. Everything about Olivia began to change from the way she wore her hair down, not up, and her fragrance channel, not girly, to the delicate tops of the stockings that took the place of her pantyhose on the outside. Olivia, the strict lawyer, resisted, but her inner desires were straining to emerge. Doug Chapel understood how to unravel a woman's restraint. He proposed a working lunch away from the office where they could focus without interruptions. A drink after work followed the lunch. Just one, he said. You've earned it. A drink would lead to a late return home. At first, David was waiting with Buster, but as summer passed into fall, David was often gone. 
Working on his boat, he said. The first summer teaching, he had acquired a little sunfish and learned to sail on Lake George. Eventually, David went to work summers at the Albany Yacht Club, earning little more than minimum wage. Olivia figured it kept some portion of his dreams alive. It added to the funds they were setting aside to start a family, a kind of baby fund. Olivia couldn't complain that David was gone when she was so often late, but Buster was always there to greet her with a quizzical look. Or was it an accusatory one? If Buster knew her inner turmoil and how dangerously close she was to the edge, he couldn't say if David suspected he was pretending not to notice. Things were clearly escalating towards a climax when the long New York winter began with an October ice storm. David had been having what he would describe as an off day. It wasn't that he disliked teaching. In fact, he enjoyed the challenge. Teaching is a far more difficult profession than people realize. There is a tremendous amount of politics. With a small p, you have to listen to the nonsense that the school administrators give you and then figure out how to do the job despite them. You have to deal with the schemes of your fellow teachers, listen to their complaints, and avoid getting involved in their personal lives and professional resentments. Then there are the parents who are either too involved in their children's lives or too indifferent. For there is never a happy medium. Finally, there is the job itself. David taught three classes of ninth grade general science, with an average of 26 students per class totaling 78 students. Year after year, they filed through his class, unaware of the physical world around them, and concerned only with who was dating whom, what their favorite pop star or rapper was doing, and most importantly, how they looked and were perceived by their fellow ninth graders. He would be the first to admit that he had it easier than the English, math, or, heaven forbid, social studies teachers. Science was a subject that could grab a student's attention, especially if you caused a small explosion at the start of class. It was easy to get their attention, but harder to keep it. And in that way, he had the toughest job of all. Finding a way to convey the rules of the universe to the future builders and shapers of our society. He realized how dangerous for society and ignorance of science could be. His responsibility was complicated by administrators, parents, politicians, religious leaders, and a grossly uninformed society that viewed his job as merely preparing his students to pass a series of standardized tests designed by the foolish for the uninformed. David had a job you could easily despise but which he had come to accept. Nevertheless, he was reaching a point where he began to dread a future tied to a classroom. He yearned for his lost dreams and sailed his little boat on the cold Hudson when the weather allowed. Unfortunately, the weather was terrible that October day. Overlapping layers of cold and moisture in the atmosphere brought neither rain nor snow but sheets of ice that covered the roads, trees, and utility lines. By noon, an emergency declaration had closed the schools and most businesses. He knew that Olivia's Audi was no match for this weather, so he drove his old diesel Ford pickup over to get his wife. Her Audi could sit in the company lot overnight, and he would drive her safely home and back to work the following day. David arrived at the GE campus in Schenectady at mid-afternoon. He was expecting that he would need to drag Olivia out of her office early. He found most of the lots already empty, and he was surprised to see Olivia walking from her building. However, she wasn't alone. There was a tall fellow walking beside her, holding an umbrella in one hand while his other arm was clearly around Olivia's waist. The way they were moving together spoke of a familiarity and a relationship that was more than two co-workers sharing an umbrella. There are times when you observe a student struggling in a course. They are doing the work but the point of the lesson is eluding them. One minute they are struggling and in the dark, and then their eyes light up and they have it. Maybe it was something, as the teacher, you demonstrated or said, but more often the insight is just there. A moment when all the disparate threads come together and understanding follows. David had such a moment, but he wasn't the teacher. His wife, Olivia, was, as she crossed a bit of icy pavement, Olivia leaned into the strange man she was walking with, putting her head to his chest and her arm firmly around him. It might have been the prudent act of a woman trying to avoid a fall, but her actions were far too comfortable. 
There was no hesitation. She was a married woman clinging to a man who was not her husband, but she showed no awkwardness or unease at that moment. David knew the meaning of all the little signs that he had seen but not recognized until that instant, the way she had been dressing for work, the vague, distracted manner she had been displaying at home for months, and her being seriously and consistently late in getting home. It should have been obvious before, but he had been unsuspecting. He had been naive and blinded by love. His first inclination was to drive away. But that wasn't who he was. He turned his truck and pushed gently on the gas pedal, bringing his truck between the couple beneath the umbrella and the entrance to the parking lot. Oliva and Doug looked up as the truck stopped blocking their way. Doug looked as if he would curse David out, but before he could, David rolled down the window and leaned out. Thought my wife could use a lift home. David said. He could see that the man holding the umbrella swallowed whatever expletives he was about to utter. Oliva just stood frozen, her mouth gaping open. David leaned out the truck's window into the freezing rain. He looked his wife in the eyes and said, Get in. There was a jagged tone of menace in his voice. Olivia extracted herself from Doug and scurried around the truck to open the passenger door and get in. As she did, David stared hard at Doug, who tried to smile back when Olivia was firmly in the vehicle. David nodded to the man holding the umbrella and put the truck in drive. The journey to their Delmar house would usually take about thirty minutes, but the inclement weather prolonged the trip to over an hour. It seemed a lot longer to the occupants of the truck's cab. They traveled in silence until they turned onto the bypass in the town of Bethlehem. Moments from home, David poked the beehive. Were you ever going to tell me about him? Asked David, his voice barely a whisper. Olivia was looking out the passenger window, and she did not turn to look at him. She contemplated denial, but then decided she had nothing to deny. No, because there is nothing to tell, she said. Doug is a co-worker. I like him, and he likes me. You get that close to all your work friends? No, of course not. Olivia said, and paused a moment before she went on. Doug is something special to me. We are close in a way that is more than simple friendship. As his Ford turned up Delaware Avenue, headed for Del Mar Place in their little three-bedroom colonial house, David contemplated his wife's statement. Just how far has this friendship gone with Mr. Umbrella? His name is Doug Douglas Chapel. He works in the real property office. He's just a co-worker then. David said, his voice dripping with such sarcasm. It was clear he didn't believe it. They reached their driveway and the side door to their home by this time, without responding to David's accusation. Olivia hopped out and hurried the few feet into the house. David parked his truck in the garage before walking to the house. By the time he entered through the door into the kitchen, Olivia was upstairs in the master bedroom. Buster was waiting just inside the kitchen door for his walk. Despite the inclement weather, the man and his dog headed out. They walked to the elementary school and its open playing fields that were deserted in the icy rain. The weather didn't bother Buster. He seemed an animal designed for adversity. By the time the two returned, they were both soaked. They descended through the side door into the basement where David threw his wet clothes in the wash and removed clean ones from the dryer. Buster was shaking himself dry, but David helped him with an old beach towel he kept in the basement for this purpose. When the two ascended back upstairs to the kitchen, they found Olivia waiting in her terrycloth robe and seated at the kitchen table with an open bottle of wine before her. We need to talk, she declared, pouring wine into two glasses. David took a seat at the table, but he didn't sit across from her. He sat at the end, so that she had to turn to look at him. It also allowed him to turn, so she was unable to directly see into his eyes. Olivia's tone was sweet, but firm. I want you to know that I love you and am very happy in our marriage, she began. But while nothing of a romantic nature has happened with Doug, it is fair to say we have a strong attraction to each other. And what is that supposed to mean? David could feel his anger rising. It was fueled by more than pure jealousy. There was a deep resentment and sense of betrayal. Olivia was his only love. In truth, 
Theirs was his first and only relationship. She was his first girl. And with her, he had found a sense of fulfillment and togetherness that filled the void in his life. She was talking again, and something in the way she carefully phrased her words reminded him she was his wife. The lawyer, a woman who was loving and caring, but whose profession is to assemble words to a purpose. It means we have a strong marriage, and I'm totally committed to it. Olivia stated, I love you, but I can't control all my desires any more than you can. I'm a woman with all the physical limitations of my gender. We can't help who we find appealing. I have known no other man but you. That I'm drawn to Doug is a fact. I can't deny it. And he said, because there is something more. So say it. She sighed. This isn't easy. I've given it a great deal of thought, and I need to get Doug Chapel out of my system. It is too hard working with him, every day, and not knowing what he would be like. Like he prompted, you're the only man I've been intimate with. He is said to be remarkable. Curiosity is natural, and he has made his interest clear. However, I haven't even kissed him. And she let that last word hang in the air. But David had turned away while she was speaking, and with her last word, he rose and said, Buster needs feeding. Olivia, let the matter drop. She was caught between the love she had for her husband and the desire she had as a woman. It had been three weeks since the ice storm. The climate had changed, and it was an unusually warm November. The weather seemed to become more unpredictable each year. There was a late-season hurricane in the Caribbean, but between Olivia and David, there was a hard freeze. They had been barely speaking since the talk, or rather, Olivia's monologue at the kitchen table when Olivia returned to work after the storm. Doug had wanted to know what had happened with David. Was he violent? Doug asked. No, he was shocked, I guess, and certainly hurt, she replied. He's not a violent man. Well, it seemed to me that he had murder in his eyes, Doug claimed. No, he's just hurt. I hurt him, Olivia said as she walked away. Doug was not a physically brave man, and David's appearance belied his mild temperament. This was unlike Julie Stevenson's husband, Louis, whose short stature and slight build concealed a violent temper. Thanksgiving came and went, and soon Christmas was upon them, along with the office holiday party. It was a modest event, limited to just the one building and without any alcoholic beverages. Nevertheless, every employee made an appearance, even if only for a short while. By that December, Doug had become intimately involved with many of the more attractive women at GE Schenectady. None of the women had expressed discontent. However, his attempts to woo Olivia had not yet been successful but he hadn't given up since the unexpected and early arrival of her husband on that icy October day. Olivia had maintained her distance, but as time passed, Doug felt that his chances were improving once again. Doug caught Olivia outside her office as the party was winding down. Soon after, they found themselves in her office with the door closed, sharing a passionate kiss. I can't, she said, pulling away. Why? You said your husband wouldn't give us trouble. It's still cheating. I owe David better than that. And what do you owe yourself? He said. You know what you want. You can't deny this. He pulled her into a tight embrace and kissed her. Try as she might, she responded and put the heat of her barely containable passion into her kiss. It took all her will to break away. I'm sorry, she sobbed. And we're just about out of time, a frustrated Doug said. What? I'm being promoted to the New York City headquarters. I'll be leaving at the end of January. They haven't announced that yet. It won't be official until the first of the year, but they told me to get ready to move. With that, he kissed her again. But Olivia continued to refuse him on her way home. Olivia thought over her situation. She was drawn to Doug but not for a lifetime commitment. His impending departure seemed like a good thing, yet she felt as though she might lose something unique that wouldn't come her way again. She loved her husband, David, and desired a home and family with him. 
However, the prospect of motherhood suddenly felt like a snare tightening around her before she had the chance to explore life. Doug had questioned what she owed to herself. Didn't she owe it to herself to have some experiences before she grew old? Was she forgoing the opportunity to be with someone like Doug Chappelle? If he left, she would miss her chance, and she knew it wouldn't come again. By the time she pulled into her driveway, she had convinced herself that she needed to be with Doug at least once before he left for the NYC offices. But she wasn't going to cheat. She would have a conversation with David and explain to him that she wanted this one opportunity to experience something different. In a way, Doug's imminent departure would make it easier. It would just be a one-off, and then he would be gone. And she and David could go back to the comfortable life they had. But she would have had this experience. She needed to find the right time to broach the subject with David. She didn't want to come out with it as some kind of fate accompli. It should be a starting point in a discussion where they could reach a mutual understanding to do precisely what she wanted. Of course, she didn't see it exactly that way. Usually they spoke, and she got her way. Few marriages grow to be truly equal in most. One party is dominant. How dominant is the point of friction? But in the case of Olivia and David, she was dominant, and there was little friction between them. David had so far agreed on every issue in their marriage. However, that was why Olivia's current wish was about to cause a significant conflict. She decided that the best time to approach David with her desires was just after dinner and before they went to their bedroom for the night. Olivia chose the Sunday evening after her office holiday party. She made David's favorite pot roast for dinner. She took care to prep herself up after dinner while David was on the couch streaming one of his nature shows. About nine o'clock, she slipped in next to him on the couch. He turned to her as he caught the faint trace of her Chanel perfume. Before he could speak, she placed a kiss on his lips. And then she said, I want to talk about the problem that's been between us. Problem. My attraction for Doug Chapel. This Doug would be Mr. Umbrella. Yes, the man in the parking lot, she said. I'm attracted to him. What does that mean? He wants me sexually, she said, and paused. And I want him. She felt his body tense next to her. And then he pulled away. She wouldn't accept his rejection, and she moved to press her body to his. She laid her head on his chest and took his hands in hers. It doesn't change how I feel about you, she said. I will want you always. It's just that I want him now in the moment. And only physically. David wasn't having it. He gently pushed her away and held her at arm's length. He made her look him in the eyes as he responded. What are you trying to tell me? Have you been with him? Because this is not what a wife says to her husband, unless she is confessing something. She smiled and looking back into his eyes, said, I would never be intimate with him without telling you first. So you're telling me, he questioned. I'm telling you. I want to have this fling before we have kids. We've set aside enough to start a family, but we've hesitated. We've been waiting. I've been waiting. And now I know why. And that is, I've never been with another man. I never knew what that was like. I was too controlled when I was younger. I never experienced life. I was too busy studying to enjoy college or law school. I just want this one fling before we settle into what will be a good life and a great marriage and family. I want just my one brief encounter. You want to have a romantic encounter with Mr. Umbrella? He nearly shouted. No, she fired back. Only an encounter. He is getting promoted and will be going to the main offices in NYC. He's leaving after the new year. I want only a few days with him right before he leaves. A weekend and nothing more. And if I say no? David asked, although he already knew the answer. I was hoping you would understand that I need this experience. She didn't give David a chance to answer, but kissed him and pressed herself against him. Her hand reached for and found his growing arousal. It's going to be all right, she thought, as they began their usual dance of love on his side. The lovemaking had a bittersweet quality. Something had been lost. This was the only woman he had ever known. And until moments before, 
she was the only woman he had ever expected to know intimately. Olivia determined that the matter was settled and told Doug that her first weekend in January would belong to him. Doug's house was on a quiet cul-de-sac in Niskayuna. It was a modest house for the neighborhood, a three-bedroom split level in a neighborhood that favored five-bedroom center hall colonials as agreed. His attached garage was open and waiting. Olivia pulled her Audi in next to Doug's porch. He was waiting for her in the living room with an open bottle of wine. For a moment, he was beneath her in the living area as she came down from the garage entry to the main floor. He saw the full effect of the short black dress that clung to her body, highlighting her figure in the alluring shape of her hips. She could see in his eyes a mixture of desire and anticipation. It was so different from the look her husband had given her as she left him only twenty minutes before. David's eyes had been sad. There was a pain there. She would have taken away if she could. But this, as she told him, was a one-time thing. And then, she would be his forever. They would have children together. Their marriage would be secure because of a love that could survive a brief affair. Theirs would be proven a strong marriage. She told her husband this because she genuinely believed it. What she was about to do was an adventure and nothing more. She meant it to strengthen their marriage and hopefully her love for her husband. Something in her believed she already had. Her body tingled with anticipation from the tips of her fingers to the soles of her feet. Her brain buzzed with excitement. They moved together as if drawn by an invisible force and met in an embrace in the center of his living room. Doug kissed her, but he drew away and said, One glass of wine, and then we need to go to dinner. I have tickets for the band at Proctor's Musical Hall. Doug knew how to appreciate his prize, to wine her and dine her and show her a good time. He relished his triumph and assured himself that he gave as good as he took. I'm completely in your hands this weekend, Olivia assured him. They had dinner in a romantic Italian restaurant in downtown Schenectady and enjoyed the show in the redesigned Vaudeville Theater. They drank very little. But when he brought her back to his place, he opened a bottle of champagne. They toasted to their weekend together before heading to the bedroom and exploring the attraction that had brought them together. He undressed her as if he were unwrapping a priceless piece of art, and he told her how beautiful she was. As he did so, she realized that he was savoring her body. He appreciated her in a way that she had never experienced before. She felt as beautiful as he said. She was here with this most handsome of men. His hands moved over her skin, igniting her passion. They lay down in his king-size bed, its satin sheets smooth and inviting. He began removing the lacy undergarments, a gift from her husband, but never worn until this moment. She unzipped his trousers, and he pushed them aside. He left on her garter belt and stockings. She slipped her hand beneath the waistband of his boxer shorts. Touching him gently, he moaned as she moved her hand. He was as substantial in size as she had envisioned. His boxers were removed, revealing his prominent arousal. Her hands reached for him, caressing gently. She leaned in to press her lips against him, taking him into her hands, which could not fully encompass his length. She traced her tongue along him, igniting a fire within them both. Kiss me, he ordered. She didn't hesitate but took him into her mouth. It was a tight fit. She moved one hand away and began to guide him in further. She maintained her grip with the other hand as he reached the back of her mouth. She planned to take him in deeper later, or at least attempt to. But for now, she relished the moment, adoring his impressive form. He suddenly pulled away and pushed her down. He spread her legs and she gave a little nervous squeal. But he wasn't ready to be intimate with her just yet. He began to kiss her intimately, attacking the area she had so neatly groomed a few hours before, groomed for him for this moment to be overwhelmed by this man. He circled his tongue around her, igniting her skin with their shared longing. She was prepared as the tip of his tongue teased her. She heard a woman moaning and realized it was her, and she was pleading, Please go ahead and insert it. He didn't respond except to lift her in place a satin-covered pillow beneath her. The tip of his member touched her. Her anticipation grew, 
and she thought she would reach the peak of pleasure right then. He began to enter her ever so slowly. She anticipated discomfort, but all she felt was his substantial presence. Gradually, he continued until she could take no more. She pressed up into him and felt a slight discomfort as he reached her depths. Doug moaned and started to move deliberately at first, then quickened his pace. It overwhelmed her, and she reached her climax. He didn't pause while she trembled and shook. He increased his speed, intensifying her pleasure. It felt prolonged but lasted only moments, and then he climaxed, releasing into her. Only then did she remember they had taken no additional precautions. She was still on birth control, but wasn't sure whether she was pleased about that or not. It had been the most perfect, intimate experience of her life, but it was far from over. They had the weekend together, two more blissful days. Sunday arrived quickly. They had spent the majority of the weekend in bed, enjoying each other's company thoroughly. She felt they had explored every avenue of intimacy. It had been enjoyable. But she was prepared to return home and reconcile with David. They ordered Chinese takeout late Sunday afternoon, and after their meal, they shared one final intimate moment before she showered, packed, and changed back into the short black dress she had worn the previous Friday evening. She slipped out the same way she had come in through his garage, into her car and out through the open garage door, thereby concealed from any nosy neighbors. No one would say she spent the weekend with Douglas. The most she could be accused of was being out with him in public on a Friday night. Soon he would be off to advancement in New York, and she would be working on having a baby with her husband. She was very content with her life. Twenty minutes later, Olivia pulled her Audi into her driveway. The house was oddly dark. The porch lights were out, and she didn't see David's truck. She assumed David had moved his truck into the garage, opening the side door. She looked for Buster to greet her return, but he was not at the door. She called out, I'm home. She expected Buster to come running, but no dog appeared. She entered the kitchen and then the living room. Both were empty. She called out again, David, I'm home. There was no answer, only silence. They must have gone for a late walk, she told herself. David must be in a down mood. He always walks Buster late when he's feeling low. She went to the refrigerator for ice, and then she poured herself a glass of scotch. She checked the bottle to see if David had been drinking, but it was nearly full. She sat down on the living room sofa and pulled her legs up and settled into the comfortable corner. She was very tired, but she knew she needed to wait for David's return to show him that nothing had changed except perhaps that her love for him would be greater. From here forward, he would be treated like the prince of a man that he is. Despite her best intentions, Olivia fell asleep. She woke to the ringing of the front doorbell. The front hall is right off the living room, and the front doorbell can be loud. Olivia was surprised to see that daylight was pouring through the front windows. She must have fallen asleep as she reached the front door. Her mind told her something was wrong. It was Buster. He wasn't jumping up and down by the door. Where is Buster? Her sleepy mind wondered, opening the door. She found a polished woman whose hair was tightly pulled back. She wore a cheap, dark pantsuit. Olivia Taylor, the woman asked. Yes, may I help you? Olivia replied. Mrs. David Taylor, yes, what is this about? I'm Detective Sylvia Marks, the woman announced, flashing a gold badge. May I come in? I need to ask you some questions. Olivia instinctively stepped back to allow the detective to enter. But then it hit her. Oh no. Olivia exclaimed. Did something happen to David? Detective Marks entered the living room and surveyed Olivia from head to toe. Olivia was still in the clothes she had come home in the night before, the short black dress she had worn to dinner with Doug. Olivia realized how unsuitable her attire was for the early morning and felt uncomfortable and ashamed. Not that I'm aware of. The detective replied. I'm here about Douglas Chappelle. Doug. I mean, Mr. Chapel. What about him? Olivia felt very exposed and confused, which apparently was what the detective desired. 
He was attacked last night as he put his trash out in front of his home. The detective began as she pulled a small notepad from her pocket. He claims to have been jumped by a man wearing a ski mask and wielding a small club. Oh my God, you're here because you suspect David. Actually, no, Detective Mark said with a bit of a smile that she could not suppress the corners of her mouth, turning up as she said, David Taylor has been eliminated as a suspect, although I will admit in the circumstances, he was our first thought, particularly since Mr. Chappell was so quick to tell us he had spent the weekend with you. Detective Mark smiled, and Olivia felt sick and went to sit down on the couch, but ended up all but collapsing into it. Detective Marks followed suit and sat down on the edge of a wingback chair facing Olivia. You said my husband was not a suspect. Olivia asked, her voice trembling a bit. No, the detective replied. The manager and staff of the Albany Yacht Club say he launched his boat, the M4, into the river yesterday afternoon and sailed south. Considering the time of year, they thought it best to keep track of him by his VHF radio and they can place him in the Hudson around Poughkeepsie at the time of the attack. Boat. Olivia asked, beginning to regain her professional composure. He took his little sailboat out on the river in January. Actually, yes, Detective Marks replied, referring to her notebook and flipping a page. She said a 38-foot Catalina, according to the yacht club manager. Apparently, he purchased it in December and had been getting it ready this last month. They say he is fortunate there is so little ice on the river this winter. They believe he is headed south. Olivia jumped up and ran up the stairs. Everything in the master bedroom looked to be in its place until she looked further and realized that some of David's possessions were missing. Little had been taken from his closet, which was filled with his work clothing, but his dresser drawers were all but empty. However, it was on her dresser that she found his note, or rather a greeting card nicely sealed in an envelope. The card's outside face read, How can I tell you how sorry I am? Inside, there was a little text poem, but she merely glanced at this because he had left her a handwritten note. Dear Olivia, I've accepted a job in Florida with a small marine research institute. It's just an entry-level position, but it's a start. I'm sorry to leave like this but I couldn't stay in this marriage any longer. And I think you were right when you said we should experience life before we truly settle down. I will miss you, but I'm not sure I love you any longer. I've taken the money set aside in our baby fund and bought a boat that I can sail south and live on when I get to Florida. Do what you want about the house and a divorce. Hope you're not mad. And that things work out with that umbrella guy. Goodbye, David. Detective Marks heard Olivia's anguished cry and rushed upstairs to investigate. Finding Olivia crumpled on her knees on the bedroom floor, she helped the woman up into a seat on the bed. Sylvia felt a twinge of guilt as she settled Olivia down and asked if she could get the grieving woman a drink. Sylvia was not particularly fond of attorneys. Moreover, Sylvia had lost her own husband to another woman and was not very sympathetic to someone unfaithful to their spouse. However, at that moment, she was responding as one heartbroken woman to another. Let me make you some tea, Sylvia offered. No, no, I'll be fine, Olivia replied. Let's go back to the living room and I will answer your questions. I really have only one. Whether you observed Louis Stevenson at any time during these last few days that you spent with Mr. Chappell. You mean my secretary, Julie's husband? Yes, but I've never met him. I have no idea what he looks like. I have a picture of him, the detective said, and handed Olivia what was clearly a mug shot of a rough-looking man staring at the photograph. Olivia shivered and said, I'm sorry. I've never seen him before. Oh, well, it was just a possibility. The victim couldn't identify him, but I thought if he was stalking you too this weekend, you might have caught a glimpse of him. I didn't see him stalking us at any time. Do you think he attacked Doug? Yeah, he's a likely suspect. Sylvia began in a cool, professional voice. He has a record for assault and a history of jealousy. Once we eliminated your husband, he was the obvious choice. 
He has an alibi, of course, provided by a group of friends. I was hoping you could place him near the scene so I could break his alibi. Sorry, but I can't help you. Will Doug be okay? He was severely injured, especially in the private areas. He's in the hospital, but I would wait a few days before visiting him. Olivia nodded as they descended the stairs. I can't see him for a day or two, Olivia said. I'm going to have to go after my husband and beg his forgiveness. That may be difficult, Sylvia said. He is probably sailing under the George Washington Bridge as we speak. With that last comment, Detective Marks took her leave of the Taylor residence. Detective Marks was wrong in one regard. By the time she left his former home, David Taylor and his dog Buster aboard the 38-foot yacht, Amor had passed the Statue of Liberty and exited New York Harbor. Then David made a starboard turn to head south by southeast and put New York on his stern and his marriage in his past. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.